Hey everyone, I'm Ron Swallow, and welcome to Reboot Rewind. Uh, this is the official after show for Reboot It, where we revisit our past episodes to talk about what worked, what didn't, and what you guys thought. Uh, today, we're coming to you live at three o'clock in the morning here in Los Angeles. <laughs> uh, so we can give some love to our fans in Europe and Asia who normally miss our live chats and have talked about it. So hello, everybody in the chat. Hey everyone, uh, Ron Swallow. Oh, yeah, Welcome sorry. Reboot, reboot. Oh, Ed has got uh, the... This is the official Man. show. <laughs> Party foul. Between, between wow, this... Wow, Ed, wow. <laughs> between that and uh, the fact that I, I started us on the wrong screen, we are off to a great start for our 3 a.m. Uh, broadcast here. This is amazing. Dude, we are at our <laughs> sharpest right now, it appears. <laughs> oh, yeah. this is amazing. Let's I can't see. even see uh, the thing. So it started over where you guys are at. What is happening, you guys? This is going great. This is what's supposed to happen at 3 a.m. in the morning, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you're, you're probably just a little bit behind it. Just roll. Just do yeah. it. Just do it. Do it. Do it. Okay, guys. So we're here for Reboot Rewind with you guys. Uh, Ed, Bill, tell everybody how much you love our fans here in the chat. Oh, I see uh, the fact that there are people in the chat, and that just really is so heartening. And uh, damn, I work nights. This is awesome, says Jose Fonseca. See, I, I, uh, Bill had the idea to come on at this time to service some of our night owls and obviously our people across the pond, you know. And uh, I think it was a great idea now. <laughs> <laughs> no, people actually showed up, which is uh, not what we were expecting. So, no. <laughs> We knew some of you guys would show up. I love uh, Colby in the chat saying, guys, it's 5 a.m. I'm going to bed. I'll watch this later. We appreciate <laughs> you staying up late enough to tell us that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Um, and this is like, uh, it's 3 o'clock here. This is like turned into when I, I don't even go to sleep now. Like I go to sleep at like 4 to 4.30. I'm at my literal best right now. Normally I'm sitting here watching Lucifer or something on the TV show. Uh, and uh, now... I've already watched all the Supernatural, so I can't just keep watching Supernatural, you guys. Sometimes sometimes I got to watch something else. Uh, <laughs> Billy Business, by the way, may still be up right now, uh, but that's because he's handling night shifts for his newborn. So we wish him well with all the bottles and the poop. <laughs> hey, listen, you know, is somebody, somebody's got to man the somebody's got to man the baby station late at night here. And uh, he's <laughs> he's on the docket, baby. Hey. Hey, that's good. You know, you, you're a team when you do that sort of thing. And Billy Business knows how to be part of a team. Uh, in the meantime, you, of course, have Ed Greer. What's up, guys? It's it's not late. It's not early. It's not any time, man, where we're going there. We don't need roads <laughs> or time. Yeah. And uh, of course, we got producer Bill. Hey, hey, uh, I am here uh, trying to run this thing as smoothly as possible. But if you see me squinting, it's because it's so late that I'm trying to read your comments and my eyes aren't working right. So I apologize in advance. <laughs> um, you guys, today we have the perfect episode to revisit in UK time zones. That's right. James Bond himself. He's, he's British, right? Right? Right, guys? I'm just kidding. I know that. Uh, this was <laughs> Ron, a season Ron, one episode. <laughs> uh, this was our uh, a season one episode. Uh, we got some pushback from viewers on this one. Uh, and I don't blame them. Uh, I also think it's safe to say for us, this was one of the toughest episodes of season one. Uh, Ed, Bill, would you guys agree with that? I definitely would. I would say I feel like most of season one, even though not all of us were totally jazzed about the Batman episode, other than this one, I think most of season one was just a string of at least solid doubles, uh, if not triples. This one... yeah. I don't know. Coming out of this one, I think I felt worse about it then than I do now, though. Okay, fair enough. Ed? Yeah, I would con I would definitely concur with that. Like, the, Especially the worse then than now. Because now I can go, okay, yeah. Sorry that we all didn't jump on Amazon and watch the hell out of uh, Jim from the office beat up people with my homeboy Wendell. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Which I still <laughs> and, haven't done. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm sorry we didn't really watch that. I definitely um, confess to being like, yeah, he should make his own missions. Like, nothing I've ever heard of. You know, I, I definitely confess of being, you know, ignorant to that. But at the same time, I think it's kind of one of the situations we ran into, not to get too deep into it, but like on the G.I. Joe episode, they're much akin to each other because yeah. 
we're kind of rejecting the basic framework of the thing. Once yeah. you do that, you're in for a world of hurt with all the fans and with yourself as you try to reconcile all this reboot and you're trying to do. Yeah, and you're trying to reboot a, a character who is, I mean, you know, with a stupid old attitude. <laughs> like, like, really, when it comes down to it. So you're trying to reboot that with a fresh thing. It can't just be him, like, trying to make out with girls and being cool. Like, you got to do a little more than that. Well, I, I would also say that, you know... It, Bond is also the poster child of reboots. Like Bond has been rebooted so many times, even even not considering his attitude towards women. If you if you start to think about where where can we take this guy? Like it's kind of all already been done either by Bond franchises or franchises aping Bond. So yeah. it's it's just tough. It's tough to to sit down and be like, how do we do a fresh, exciting, unexpected, never before seen version of James Bond. Uh, that's that's a tall order after 60 and years and 25 movies. Dude, more than more than more than almost any other property we've tried to do. This is very much that third day after the turkey turkey sandwich you try to make where well, you you find yourself carving cartilage trying to get those slivers of meat off of there you know because the turkey's been picked clean we were trying to make a big fat dagwood turkey sandwich out of that <laughs> carcass that's left that is and an amazing it's reference so it's so hard to do that that's what we tried to do no, yeah it's so it absolutely is and yeah so i mean look i think we got frustrated going through all that nonsense. And so maybe, just maybe, by the end, we had polished ourselves a diamond and to us it still looked like a turd. But I don't know. You guys got to tell us what you think. I want to uh, I, I want to keep the chat in this because this is sort of like the, uh, the once-in-a-lifetime chance for uh, those in Europe and Asia and Africa. But uh, I want to know, Stephen in the chat says, this is perfectly timed with my lunch break tonight. I want to know where all you guys are at. We've got about 20 people in the chat right now. Just g drop us a line where you are in the world because uh, yeah. I, I yeah. just kind of want to know where everybody's tuning in from. It'd be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Because that way uh, we know uh, whether we should do this again. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Ron's or uh, ideal whether time. we should go back to normal. This is my ideal time. A lot of times we do it at like one o'clock, which is when I'm just waking up. And I would love to do something where I'm not just waking up. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Thomas Wade says he's in Minnesota. I've mm. been to Minnesota. I've been to Minocqua. Uh, no, uh, I've been to Minneapolis, Minnesota. I've been to Minocqua, uh -huh. Wisconsin. Look at Frank Lakemeyer coming in hot. Yep. Germany. <laughs> Greetings from Germany. Also, are you planning a rewind on Fantastic Four? It's my least favorite episode. Oh, <laughs> it's your least favorite episode. That's interesting. I assume that you're an over-obsessed fanboy, which we like. So no worries. Exactly. Well, dude, that was the one. Uh, just to give a tease of the, of the reboot rewind we're going to do on that. When Bill came in hot with the, hey, man, no 60s crap. You're dumb. And just he just laid down the Infinity Gauntlet ultimate nullifier of all a bunch of people's favorite Fantastic Four uh, fanfic ideas right off the bat. So it was like <laughs> beating up the Hulk and killing, you know, uh, Loki right off the bat. That's what he that's what Bill did in that episode. So that's what we'll, I'm here we'll for, baby. <laughs> we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll do one on that. Uh, and Steven said he's in Arizona. Uh, Charles Clark is in Maryland. Oh, Jose's from my yeah. hometown. Essex mm. UK, we got we got the UK. We literally actually got the UK. We were trying to yes. do the London calling thing. That's what we wanted. Uh, we got somebody from New Mexico. Yeah. What's mm -hmm. up, Jose? Mm -hmm. well, I'm from Albuquerque. I know how it is. Uh, Steven said it makes sense why Ron posts rollerblading videos at 2 a.m. Yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> that's when I finished it. Uh, that's how we do it. We got, All of those Maryland. rollerblading videos. Yeah. You guys, we really appreciate you guys being here. Um before we dive into the plot and casting, though, let's talk a little bit behind the scenes. Uh, we decided pretty early that Bond B would be one of our franchises going into season one. Mm -hmm. Maybe the most interesting thing about this episode is that on that day we recorded it, this was actually our third consecutive reboot it after <laughs> Back to the Future and Indiana Jones. So it had been a very long day, right? Yeah. 
that's the other thing. You know, I think we talked about this a little bit in the Back to the Future Rewind, but, you know, we gang shoot these. So especially in season one, we were, you know, where we had to light the set and kind of get all the set dressing in there. You know, we tried to get as much out of one day as possible. So, yeah, we had done Back to the Future and Indiana Jones, and we came in dragging our butts (laughs) before Mm -hmm. James Bond even started. Yeah, yeah, I mean, do you guys think that that contributed to uh, the how long it took us f- to crack it on top of it already being difficult, or no? no? It, it was it was like trying to disarm a bomb after you've just played like a whole game of basketball, and you're <laughs> and you're fing- and so you're tired as hell, you're not quite thinking right, and your fingers are sweaty, and right then you have to do this intricate task, because I'm telling you, all of us are our critic brains were on 500,000 because we had already done a a really critical process through two other things and succeeded. So when we turned our super critic brains on this and our other brain that the creative one was like, I'm tired then. I don't know. I don't know then. And we, then we started being very creative with coming up with what had been done before. Plus we had had just, we had just eaten Popeye's. And that's that's the other thing about that day is I don't know if you guys remember this, but I, I encountered this when I was editing it. I mean, we recorded maybe 20 minutes of an Indiana Jones episode, then had to stop due to crazy work noise outside the studio. And then we came back and restarted Indiana. So we had actually done like two and a half episodes before we even sat down to tackle bond. And I don't know what we were thinking, but we deliberately said, let's put the one that we're least excited about that we're least confident about at the end of the day oh. no, dude you know what? we had evil knievel syndrome we thought we could just ramp it up baby yeah we, we, we thought we were just gonna ramp you know and and it turned out to be more like a a hot rod <laughs> you know what i mean it, it, we really didn't complete this <laughs> we didn't complete the stunt uh, my wife was just watching that movie i, I came in like halfway <laughs> through i forget how amazing that movie is that, that it's pretty oh, hilarious i love that yeah, the stuntman actually broke his leg on that famous that famous miss jump that they sell the movie on. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, his yeah. leg literally broke in that scene. But anyway, uh, this whole thing about uh, us trying to like, okay, yeah, he's going to design his own mission. How do you make a uh, cue? Blah blah. Just to blow, uh, just to just to toot our horn a little bit. Um, I think how we came up with, in the end, how we worked. China in so that we could get the money. That's all I cared about at the end. We made it producible. We worked China in. Mm-hmm. That's all yeah. I really cared about. That's pretty funny. I want to I want to pop over to the chat. Jose Fonseca. I think what would be interesting is all the old Bonds coming together a la Avengers. It's the one aspect of Bond that the other spy movies do not have. Guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but the the franchise has never acknowledged the idea that Bond is... is- uh, uh, just a, a mantle passed from one guy to the other. I th- I, I believe the Broccoli's, uh, who the the family who owns the rights to James Bond, is still holding firm that Bond is one guy. I I don't think mm-hmm. they actually want to. I think that's a bridge too far for them. The idea that Bond is some sort of like mantle passed through the British Secret Service. Yeah, uh, that, yeah. I don't think that would work well. Uh, I mean, I actually like the idea. I just don't think that people would let us do it that's a super fan servicey idea that i think would be less awesome in practice than you think it would be in your head I, i'm just it saying. might be a good comic book it would be a sweet comic absolutely yeah because you you could you could use it as a like a off like an offshoot an off world type of thing where all the bonds come together to stop the ultimate bond villain who is maybe combined into one guy or something like that i don't know oh you'd have to ha- you'd have to do like an old broken down blofeld but like the original blofeld and now he's he's got like robotic parts it's like uh yeah so remember when mr freeze came back in the revamped batman animated series and it was all it was very disturbing because he was just a disembodied head with like spider legs you'd like, oh you'd, yeah you want to do something like that with blofeld I love it. That's great. <laughs> yeah, somebody's <laughs> so screwed up from trying to beat Bond that they that they have to like literally pull themselves back together. Yeah, that's nasty. All yeah. right. Um, go ahead. No, I was going to say, Ron, take us take us further down this uh, rabbit hole. Let's do it. Let's get into the pitch. 
Uh, oh, but as a warning, uh, I have multiple cats and uh, they may try to make an appearance. I just want to let you know that uh, it is hard to keep them out. They're very, very uh, sneaky. Dude, my, uh, I, I, so, keep, I keep wanting, I have a new cat. Uh, we just got a cat a couple weeks ago. I keep wanting oh, it to cool. make an appearance. And he is literally, like the past three live shows that we've done, he has just been sleeping on this blanket on my couch next, right next to me. Just doesn't give Aww. a shit at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Ash is going to climb up here any moment. Uh, so here, let's get into it. The pitch. Uh, the problem we ran into with Bond is it's already been rebooted four times. Uh, so there just aren't a lot of places left to go with the character. Then every time we talked about a new angle, we realized another franchise had already done it. So like Bond with a team is Mission Impossible. Bond in training is Kingsman. Uh, this is my favorite one that Bill wrote. Shaky cam average Joe Bond is Jason Bourne. Nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. Bond as a retiree pulled back into the game is John Wick. Bond as an analyst turned super agent is Jack Ryan, which we found out. Bond as ultra-grounded modern spycraft is Homeland. And the gritty origin of Bond is literally the last reboot, Casino Royale. Uh, so, yeah. What about that, guys? Yeah. No, <laughs> what I, about that, guys? <laughs> that's what I was saying. It's like, it's, it's really unbelievable. Like, any sort of easy answer about, like, how do we reinvigorate this franchise has been done and done well. Yeah. Oh, and uh, I agree with maybe with Bright Axe here that says uh, James Bond in the in the future. <laughs> like, if you could come up with because Mission Impossible does a credible job of coming up with spycraft in the future, mm. given all the gadgets that they really do, like these things, you know, the the masks and the the vo the vocoders and stuff, and the you know Halo jobs and the you know they do a lot of really cool stuff. Look yeah. at this freaking. Hi. I'm anyway. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys. Right now, my cat is drinking milk out of my cup, and then my milk? other cat's just—is it milk or milk? It's milk. You say milk, okay, you <laughs> bastard. That's how you say milk. I love that Ron has a cup of milk sitting on his desk because he was dunking cookies in it before we started recording. That's right, guys. Living the dream. Sorry about that. Um, let's get back into the real uh, thing that we're talking about, rather yes. than me laughing at my cats. <sighs> yeah. Focus. Focus on the cats. Oh, wait, no. Focus on the James Bond, you guys. So it is a problem, though, because it, it's hard to reboot something. And it's and it's not only like that, but when you there have been so many offshoots of different spy movies that it is very hard to come up with something original and spy. -y. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you make a spy movie into a whole different genre. That's one thing. But even like even like some of the spy stuff that the Marvel movies did, they did super spies. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So even if you chose to do super spies from the future, that's just your riff on the Marvel universe at present. You yep. know what I mean? It's like, damn. Yeah. Yep. No, it's so, uh, I mean, I remember even sorry, Ron, not to cut you off, but I remember even no. when The Dark Knight came out, like everybody made a big deal about it being such a takeoff on heat. But there was a ton of James Bond in there. Shit, there's a ton of James Bond in Inception. I feel like there's a ton of James Bond in almost everything Christopher Nolan does. So it's like that's mm. the other thing. Bond is like Bond is so infused into all these different blockbuster stories. Uh, again, it's just it's such an oversaturated character. Yeah, it becomes like a Edgar Rice Burroughs type shit where it's mm. like. I don't want to read no Edgar Rice Burroughs story right now. Tarzan, he grows up in the jungle. Confederate dude goes to Mars and gets a better <laughs> jumping ability than the natives. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> and you just start being like, this is trash. But then you realize, as has been told to me many times and as I've realized, that sort of storytelling is part of the birth of that super genre. Yeah. And it's infused in everything you think you're above, you know, or you think you want to move past or whatever, or you think the things that make the the pillars of the genre you're talking about are infused in these things. So, I mean, Bond is that way. He's an originator, but at the same time, the whole reason we were trying to do it is they have rebooted it a bunch of times. It's been done. Like our task that we had had been literally done a bunch of times. Tons of times. So <laughs> and and like so, you said done pretty well yeah a majority of the time so 
Uh, well, let's get into the pitch. Uh, here's where we ended up. We came up with a character arc that could carry a trilogy. Our bond starts as an idealist, idealistic analyst who doesn't work well with others. His brain is wired differently. People can't keep up with him. He gets a chance to do field work and taps into an adrenaline junkie side of himself. He turns into a guy who wants to be a James Bond type, but the reality is being James Bond in espionage will get you killed. Our Bond doesn't really know how the spy game works. The midpoint of movie one is Bond in total failure because he rushes in to kill someone, but he realizes that that's just a domino and a spy game being run by people above his head. So it motivates him to level up his own understanding of the game. This disillusionment also gives him a viable motivation to perhaps consider a normal family life one or two movies down the road, adding to his arc. We cast Kit Harrington as this constantly learning and growing new version of Bond. We cast Donnie Yen as a Chinese super agent who can counsel the young, headstrong Bond. Bond comes to think Yen's a double agent because he's involved in some shady second level to the plot, but it turns out he's working with the deepest unit in M16, the double O unit. This introduces Bond to M, Q, and Money Penny. RM, Q, and Money Penny are all venerable British actors who could have all been big players in the Cold War. Our M is Gary Oldman, Money Penny is Helen Mirren, and Q is Michael Caine or Patrick Stewart. For villains, we wanted masterminds who would be more Bond-like than our Bond. So we went with Jeremy Irons and Andrew Garfield. That was an interesting one. Mm -hmm. uh, one's a politician and one's a defense contractor. The plot is that whoever leads the corporation has the technology to create natural disasters. Then they are the leading contractor providing relief and rebuilding efforts. Uh, that's a, I thought that was a good one. Uh, for at least one of the villains, Bond wants to kill him, but M tells him he can't. It would cripple the country's disaster readiness. This kind of moral ambiguity sets the table for our whole series. We're dropping an inexperienced Bond into a homeland-like setting and watching as he screws everything up by being too much like James Bond. His journey then becomes about learning how to actually operate in a world of statecraft and spycraft and what that means in the modern day. Uh, now that we're many months removed, how do you think we did on the reboot? Are there holes you want to fill? Did we miss anything? Did we just create Amazon's Jack Ryan series as several people commented? <laughs> well, no, you know, what's funny. We, we created both Amazon's Jack Ryan and Amazon's Patriot as well, uh -huh. because what, uh, and not necessarily so much of Patriot, but Patriot was another direction that I would have liked to go in it. When I was, when we were talking about the idea, one of the things I was like, well, why don't we ever get to see the, inter we talked a little bit about flipping assets Flipping assets means you go get a desk job at a company and you talk to a guy at a cubicle for four months yeah, trying yeah. to trying to get it close enough to him for him to go, yeah, man, I've got this secret encryption. I don't even know what to do. Well, I'm going to put a bag over your head and take you to the black site because now I've verified you. Or, hey, buddy, uh, you want to tell me some stuff, uh, blah, blah, and like leverage that relationship stuff that you built for four months. That isn't exactly the most exciting thing, but that was exactly what they dramatized in Patriot on Amazon. They had a dude go flip assets throughout this company. Then he had to go be in this other country. He was getting hurt all the time. His fingers got like chopped off. Crazy stuff happened in the, in the story. And it was like Elmore Leonard wrote a spycraft thing. Mm. Like the worst things that happened to you in spycraft. And you just got to keep going. Your fingers are off, but you still got to pretend that you're a guy who works for an oil company. And you still got to go to a party and hobnob with some people, although your fingers got chopped off. And then you might have to shoot a dude later and then kidnap a dude. But maybe you might have to kidnap a lady and a dude. I don't know yet. And that's your evening. Because yeah, you're in spycraft. Ever and have you ever had to shoot a guy when your fingers got chopped off? It is not easy. <laughs> dude, nubs, nubs, very hard on triggers. <laughs> yeah, dude. So I'm just saying, like it was like it was like all the stuff that we might have like that to me would be a a, a mighty gritty take that I might have pitched or whatever, but and sort mm -hmm. of held back. But like that was just patriot. It's like damn, even the stuff that we didn't debut, it's already been done. It's sad. It's. it's it's interesting though, because I think what we're kind of talking about is is almost like you're taking the audience on a journey of understanding that the world of of how this shit works isn't Bond, it's Patriot. And I think that if you make Bond a really sympathetic protagonist, the mm -hmm. audience comes to sort of understand that over the course of three movies alongside him. And that's why I, I really like the idea we kept saying in the episode bull in a china shop 
but not in like a big heavy bruiser way. He's just a dude who thinks he's smarter than everybody, probably is smarter than everybody, doesn't want to stop and wait for people to catch up to him, and is so confident in sort of his own analytical mind that he's going to go and make moves thinking he has a handle on everything, and it all blows up in his face. And so that idea of how do you take a guy who is, he almost is that 1950s male ideal, right? He's, he's hyper competent and hyper confident and doesn't take no for an answer. And then just show that like, nope, none of that works. I, yeah. and, and not just stop there, then matriculate it into like, here is how it actually is done. Here is the better way to do it. And then for him to be able to step back, maybe in, even in movie two and be like, this isn't better. This sucks. And then the response is like, yeah, that's the game. It does suck. All of this sucks, but that's the game. I, right. I think that's interesting. Well, I mean, the, yep. the, the whole crux of rebooting this particular character is making a framework so that you can explore somebody teaching somebody spycraft. Honestly, yeah. that's it. That's it. Yeah. I mean, really, when you get down to it, that's it. That's it for every single time they do an iteration, even this newest one. He shoots some guy and then he goes and he gets a dissertation as to whether you're a double O now or not or whatever the hell. It gets He's always being disavowed. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, yeah. you know, so, so it's like every single time we get this is intro to spycraft in our conception of it. In the 60s, it was, hey, put these on your eyes. Now you're an Asian. We have so much technology. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, it, it, it was that back then. It's different stuff right now, but it's always just just intro to Spycraft. Here's our version of Spycraft every every ten years with a new yeah. guy with black hair, usually. Mm. Well, you know well, what I mean? Well, I, I I do want to bring in some of the comments because I think that it actually uh, will start a little bit of a conversation. Tom Wade said, "Honestly, I really like the idea of an idealistic idealistic Bond. Bond tends to be a rather cynical guy in the films. So that would have been a big change that we we did." as compared to uh, previous Bond films, which again, that our goal is when we reboot it is to, to start it off somewhere. And, and maybe he turns cynical by the third movie. I think that's kind of, I well, mean, more than that, I think, I think he turns cynical and then by the third movie, you, you have to find an equilibrium. And I don't even really know what that is off the top of my head, but it's like he starts queen and country, man. I am doing the best for England and I'm going to make sure that everybody is safe and protected and Oh my God, this is yep. horrible. Oh, what do I have to do in order to actually do that? You're telling me I have to like let these guys be bastards because if I took them out, it would hurt England and the, and the British people in a whole other ways. I don't want to do that. You know what I mean? And it's like you're building the cynicism. Then it's like you just have to bring them back from the brink. Yeah. So he's got some kind of middle ground where he's, he's cynical enough to get the job done right, but idealistic enough to do the right thing on top of that, I mm -hmm. guess, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, go ahead. Speaking of the chat, I, I just want to bring in uh, yeah. Sean Hannon, County Tipperary, Ireland. Uh, just another one of our European viewers. We, we got to give these guys love because that's who we're doing this for. Um, and then also there seems to be a bit of a debate about everybody's favorite Bond. Uh, I think we, we covered this in the original episode, but... It, it, the only thing I'll say is it's tough. If you are somebody who loves Sean Connery, I totally get why you would love Sean Connery, but like, we're never going to get back there. Not to be, not to be an mm -hmm. asshole. You know what I mean? But like, that's, that's such a product of its time, such a product of that one actor, such a, such a lightning in a bottle thing. Also just the fact that it was new and it was breaking new ground in cinema. I just don't think we're going to get back to that vibe in so many different ways. Yeah, unless That's we a, had, what's the guy's name from uh, who did the smoking TV show? What's the Mad Men? <laughs> what's that guy? John, John Ham. John Ham. John Ham. Even him, yeah. he's not even British. I guess neither yeah. was Connery. No, but, but he could play British. I'm sure. Yeah, he Connery, is a be, decent being, actor. being Welsh, you got to put up with British people, which teaches you about British people. Ah. Oh, but before somebody comes for us in the chat, uh, Connery is Scottish. Scottish. Yes. Scottish. I thought he was Welsh. Whatever. He's, he's, Scottish. he's Scottish. Pretty sure Scottish. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. That's fine. Pierce Brosnan might be Welsh. Sean Connery. Catherine Zeta Jones is Welsh. Yes, uh, somebody true. I wanted to know what you thought of Timothy Dalton's Bond. Dude, I love Timothy Dalton's Bond. I actually. Yeah. I feel like he got a little bit of a raw deal. I mean, he 
he felt like a modern Bond. They kind of foppished him up when they bought, brought Pierce, Bob, uh, Pierce Brosnan in. <laughs> yeah, well, dude, absolutely. You, you say he got a raw deal. I think those movies resembled raw deal a yeah. little too much. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. So uh, let's uh, let's let's bust into some comments. What do you think? Yeah, I think we could do that. Uh, well, the first one we already tackled a little bit, but I think it's worth bringing up again, and we can maybe talk about it a little bit more. Um, it was uh, Orange Hokage 7, maybe Hokage, Hokage, I don't know. Eh. Uh, I like this, but too bad they basically said the plot to the Jack Ryan series as their starting off point. An analyst who lives alone discovers some nefarious plot and starts investigating it, ends up being brought into the spy aspect of the case, and by the end of it decides he loves the excitement of being a spy slash agent. Jack Ryan is also very moralistic and is not used to dealing with unsavory criminals, but realizes this is the way the world works and has to adapt to that change. By the end, he decides to pursue being a spy slash agent instead of advancing his career as an analyst. Well, I mean, as Ed said, uh, we just hadn't gotten around to watching uh, that multi-million dollar John Krasinski vehicle. Um I also think I mean look there's a there's a major difference just with between an American story of that nature and a British story of that nature. I also I got to tell you I have since watched the pilot episode of that show and it is yeah. legitimately bad. Like it is it is not good. Um Okay. Well you know pilots are bad. I I reserve judgment until I see until I until I slog through the whole first season, and I go, was it worth it or not? Then that's how, how I usually judge television shows. But I do hate that they that they think that they can get away with that. So if you quit after the pilot, that is your right as an American. I really feel that. I yeah. really do feel that. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, anytime you watch a thing talking about how to write pilots, they say the first thing you should do is make sure you grab people. And if you aren't grabbing people, you're not doing your job. So get it together. Yeah. It's uh, also, but, being, I, yeah. as long as we're as long as we're throwing around the hot takes here at uh, three thirty in the morning, uh, that show also felt like it was trying to be Homeland, but with dumber writers. Um, <laughs> it just felt like they had a writing staff that didn't quite know how to craft that sort of a plot, and so it just came off as very contrived and overblown. Uh, when it definitely shouldn't have. So we could we could improve on it there. I'll just say that. Yeah, well, and everybody else, uh, there was another comment earlier where someone had said uh, that it was a very slow start too. Like the first, like somebody quit before the first season because of how long it was taking to get moving. So, it, it, you know, I feel like we actually had a pretty quick, like movement towards the plot, towards the action, towards things actually happening too. Well, I, I also think I also think that it's one of those things where I gotta say the it's a really hackneyed plot, but I very much love it. And it goes like this. I'm a regular person, but something's wrong. I pull on this thread. I discover some stuff. These fools discover me because I discovered that stuff. Uh-oh. Oh damn, I'm in the life now. Honestly, that, yeah. That plot is so old and so dope. You never, you never, you almost never refuse it. It has to be done super bad to fail. And we sort of built our story in that fashion. We tried to do that at least. I will also say that I think from, from the pilot that I watched that Jack Ryan show so hangs on him being like a smug Dartmouth asshole. And I, I think what we were talking about with our James Bond was that he was going to be a little more streetwise. Like he was going to be a little squirrelier, a little weirder, a little, a little less sort of on the straight and narrow than they portray Jack Ryan in that show. Like Jack yeah, Ryan almost, is a white bread dude in that show. Yeah, it's almost like he's a, a creative type more than he's like your staid you know, straight and narrow guy at the, at the agency type of thing. He's, he's, he's well, your creative guy. But it's what happens when you kind of do the, the, and I haven't seen a lot of the show, but it just seems like I remember the, the um, limitless show mm. that they I did. I liked that show, and by the way. It was like a super smart, I did too. And it was a super smart guy 
who there's a bunch of cops with guns and they're pointing them at everything, but they don't know what to point it at. But this guy takes the pill and he knows what to point it at. And sometimes he has to give them the slip to do some stuff. But in the end, they solved the case, yada, yada, yada. I can see why it didn't go on. I don't know how much growth there was for, for that stuff. There was an underlying plot. All I'm saying is those type of stories where some smarty smart guy taking up, beating up people as like a hobby. If I was a hardcore operator, I would take that personally as a super diss. I'm sorry, if I was a real hardcore operator, kill you with a felt tip pin type guy, I would really take offense to that. So that's one thing I think we we tried to, again, maybe it's a Kingsman of it all, but like having, and, and I think having him be a guy who's barely in this is obeying the Daniel Craig and even maybe Sean Connery tradition of the character. These guys are barely you know what I'm saying? They're always getting dressed down, as we talked about before. Mm-hmm. They're always getting dressed down. They're always getting told what's what. And it's like, it's been theorized that this is uh, a masculine response to the hen peckery of the modern world. You can't shoot people for no reason. You can't grab my boob for no reason. You aren't entitled to my body or my country. How dare you, you world? <laughs> yeah, you can't come over to my country and just shoot people for your interest and then jump in a plane and kiss a kiss a native woman and drop her off. You know what I'm saying? You yeah. can't do that anymore. Then he's yeah. like, no, yes, I can. And I'll do it for her majesty. And I, we just love that and ate it up. And again, I think we tried to bucket in the thing. All I'm saying is a streetwise guy who gets into that and thinking he's getting to, into the posh life of being a super spy and then realizes it's dirtier than any of the criminal stuff he used to do before he got in the service. I think that would be a good arc for us that we didn't quite articulate in there, but I think okay. now that we have the 2020 hindsight, although I gotta... almost a, a criminal. Cause I, one thing I was just going to say, yeah. I watched this movie deep cover recently and it was all about how Lawrence Fishburne's character was trying to be a good cop, but he wasn't, he, and he was a decent one, but when he got interviewed to be a criminal, that's when his cop career really took off. And he went mm. super deep cover as a drug dealer, and he found himself way better at being a criminal than being a cop, and that's what made him such a good undercover cop. And he worked his way up to the top guy, and he did all this great stuff, but then the State Department told him, all right, you did, you did your job, now you gotta stop, because now you're gonna bust people that we like, and you gotta stop now. And he, he got some other cops killed. Some cops, just like he used to be, killed doing this stuff. And he realized the game was rigged and it was all bad. And at the very end, after the movie, I don't want to spoil it, but he gets he gets the story out that that bad stuff was being covered up by the State Department. And he has to leave the force, but he leaves it with some money that he got from being a drug dealer <laughs> and some some sort of plan to like try to fight for good even outside the system, which was irrevocably broken. Hmm. I think we could work something around like that at the end of the, at the end of the third movie of our stuff. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. This is the other thing that we haven't really talked about, but I love everything you're saying. I just don't know if the broccolis would love it. The the people who who control the rights (laughs) to bond, you know what I mean? It's like, that's the other thing that keeps the character so constrained is like, they're so specific about what it can and cannot be. And there is there is such almost like a national identity. There's almost like a patriotism for England tied up in the character. And when you start to disillusion him too much, when you start to say, oh, this corruption is so bad that he's just going to piss off and take, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars with him for his troubles, I, I think that's over the line. That's all That's all it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. But like trying try to edge towards like like even even that's why i loved um skyfall people thought skyfall was kind of boring and he ends up blasting fools with a musket at a cabin and stuff i like but that. like but i love that i, I, I like skyfall was, i like it better than I, casino royale i, I uh, me too well i'll so, take sally you had have you had javier bardem just killing it as a bond villain in that too yes so agreed that agreed um i i would also like to say that what am i like I loved that we worked in the, the uh, China into this. Mm-hmm. And I love the idea of Donnie Yen. Like I even saw a scene where Donnie Yen, like uh, where James Bond is about to do some dumb shit. He grabs his gun and he's going to really ruin something. And Donnie Yen comes in and puts his hand on, on the gun and is like, not yet. Wait. 
and then they he you know takes them aside to have a conversation and then then the violence happens in a place where it's not seen by the people who need you know who if they saw it would ruin the whole operation type of thing or something like that so I'm, i don't know i just saw some cool scenes like that i buy that i totally buy that um Looking at the chat real quick, uh, big ups to Sartek Bandari, who's a diehard fan, shows up all the time. He just got in a little bit late. Chad Haunts says, oh shit, I made it. Yes, you did. And we're giving you a shout out for making it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, some good conversation. Uh, Jose Fonseca, who's been very active in the chat, says an idealistic Bond is a different take. Is cynicism part of Bond's identity, though? We, uh, we definitely address that. And uh, yeah. I uh, just wanted to give some shout outs while we, uh, while we had a break in the action. Absolutely. Um, and let's, uh, let's get to the next, uh, the next comment. Let's do it. Uh, this is, this is my favorite name, the casual anarchist zero three zero. Uh, I'd cast a South Asian person as bond. Why? Okay. Hear me out. Who are the baddest dudes in the British army? Uh, Gurkhas. They are some of the most feared fighters in the world. They are so effective that when Prince Harry went to war, they put him with a Gurkha unit. So why not make Gurkha the next Bond? There's a lot of juicy story there, flashbacks to how he had to train from childhood, fighting for an empire where the general population is racist towards him, and also being looked down upon in the elite circles he infil infiltrates. This would be an entirely new spin on the character. Also, it would be a beautifully diverse casting choice that makes an insane amount of sense without being stunt casting. Hmm. I mean, I uh, I boned up on Gurkhas, and I gotta say, they're really hardcore warriors, and uh, their actual like weapon of choice, you know, uh, uh, is like a big curved knife, and uh, they sharp they sharpen only the part near their hand, so they got to get up on you to use it, and they are have been known in military deed and tale to chop full like jump into trenches and just start chopping fools up like a bunch of them would jump in with their boomerang knives and just chop people up and like you got a gun but so what i'm already on you and i'm chopping you up stop it you know and it's like brutal and that's great and i can see like iwu uh iwu Quase playing that role or something like that from uh from a uh, um raid, raid. raid redemption yeah you yeah. know uh uh because obviously they're nepalese people from you know the himalayas and jazz uh, most of the Gurkhas are from different tribes there, you know? Yeah. And uh, I love the fact that they are like so uh, devoted to the British empire, but I don't though. And I, and I get why you're bringing it up and how it would be at a whole level of political intrigue and like politics, frankly, identity politics, frankly, to it. I think that would be really great. Again, I don't think the broccolis are like that. Yeah, right. My personal, my my personal pitch along those lines, though, I got to tell you, and I know that it would be, it sounds just as bad, quote unquote, as the Gurkha pitch, which again is hardcore, and I like it. Mm -hmm. uh, I would want to make James Bond uh, Indian, because the, the British have been over there fucking around so so, so much yeah. that it's just it's natural. It's very natural for a person to be like, look, I've got all the way through, I uh, got all the way into MI6 and I've done all the training and Indian dudes. And, and um, I, I'm saying is the infiltration aspect. Every time you see one of those scenes uh, of everybody, of the richest, most powerful people in the world, there are, he would, he could blend in with those people. And I just think it would be, it would acknowledge the empire nature of uh, uh, just like the Gurkha story would. But it would be like, I don't know, I could see like a really handsome dude slipping right in there and being a good Bond. I'm I'm totally on board with that. Um, the thing I love about the Gurkha suggestion, even if it's not, you know, a Nepalese person, is this idea that, yeah, if if the backstory of Bond is that he was just like a savage royal marine, but early on they recognized oh this guy is super super smart and so they pull him out of his marine duties and they give him this job with mi6 but then he starts to get restless like it's and it's it, it could pick yes. up exactly how we've been talking about right that like he he is smarter than everybody he doesn't work well with everybody he's constantly trying to do his own thing all that still holds holds true but it's a whole other dimension if even further back he has this sort of really hardcore combat training, which can also then pair to the class thing that we were talking about, where it's like, if he is a hard scrabble guy who grew up poor, who 
hasn't had a great life. The military was his way out. Now he gets cherry picked out of being sort of cannon fodder to be this bigger thing. And right there, it's like, that's a great arc to sort of build his idealism is like he bootstrapped his way up to being like a hero of the country. And then now you're going to tell me that to be a hero of the country, I got to be dirtier than I've ever been before. Like that sucks. Well, and, and one thing we kind of tried to reject in this whole, he picks his own mission stuff, which I totally cop to is Ian Fleming, who I think we could call an expert on James Bond. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ian Fleming, the the creator of James Bond, said, or, or rather described him as a blunt instrument used by the state. And we were literally trying to make him not that. Or if you want to flip it and try to see if you could get out of it, where, where he starts out being a blunt instrument and gets sharper and sharper. And the sharper he gets, the more dangerous he gets. And the more these higher ups react to him, which again... I got to say is how they were doing it in the Daniel Craig thing. Mm, so I yeah. just say, let's just keep that party train moving. It's, it's gone all the way up to him busting up Spectre, probably beating up Christoph Waltz and throwing him in some more acid and Monica Bellucci comes back to life or whatever the hell happens in this one. A lot of stuff. And then they go wrap it up. You know, it, it is weird. I mean, it is weird with those Daniel Craig movies where like, the first movie was straight up origin story. The second movie was a direct continuation. And then in the third movie, which was Skyfall, it was like, Bond, you're a relic of the Cold War. We don't need the likes of you anymore. And it's like, oh, geez, he literally went from being like a rookie Dude. to being obsolete. Dude, yeah. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to call it what it is. The Nolanization of the world. Every time a hero, all these old heroes that we've had, uh, Moore, uh, what's his name? Roger Moore. Roger Moore did 27 of these movies. Don't correct me. He did 27 of these at least, movies. At least 27. At least I, I 27. Think it might be 80. I think it might be 80. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And now we get this hero who's like, oh, man, I got arthritis in my hip. I, stop it. He's, you got you to gotta have a leg brace. You got to think about it. You got to. You got to give Harvey Dent your job. No, no, stop with that. It's so stupid. And they did it to Bond. Yeah, this whole concept that he was over the hill. He just started. <laughs> he literally just started. <laughs> he was, walked out of the water. He just started a minute ago. That was the weirdest part to me, man. I'm telling you, that was <laughs> super bizarre. Yeah, I don't need an old ass Bond personally. I don't know. It's just just my opinion. Oh, here comes another cat. Let's go to the next comment, uh, and this is related to the last comment. Uh, we have T. Paul uh, Javier O. That's the name. Tom Hiddleston did a James Bond light already. Hardy aged out. Riz Ahmed would fit in with Ed's point. So, if you don't know, Riz Ahmed was the villain in Venom. Um, and has been uh, he's he's been popping up everywhere like the past three years. Um, was really good in season two of the OA, which uh, is a, a series on Netflix that more people need to watch. It's unfortunately been canceled, but the two seasons we got were extraordinary. Um, so um, Nightcrawler, he was very yes, good in Nightcrawler. Very good in Nightcrawler. He's just a great actor. I believe he started as a rapper and now is much better known as an actor. Yeah, I think he was also on an HBO series that was basically just him in a room with some cops oh, or something. The, the night of, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was like his big breakthrough. Man. Oh, awesome! I that's I have a bunch of fun stuff to watch. I'm gonna get on that. Yeah, but like that sort of guy as as like as James Bond or about to be James Bond. I kind of love that, but again, I wish the bro I, I would hope the broccolis would understand that the world marketing capability of of an Indian slash whatever kind of uh, amorphous brown from any sort of eastern area mm -hmm. would be so sick because obviously again any country just wave your hand in a general west of or east of europe direction and you'll run into a place where the britain had an empire set up yep, you know what I'm or had a colony set up absolutely. so it's like any of those countries you could pick a new james bond from and he would be like the gurkhas like the like those uh like those sikh warriors who were kicking it with uh with the british in world war one mm -hmm. like all of that stuff you, you have all these places you can pick from different soldiers so like i love that yeah i think that's a awesome. great suggestion uh so Let's see. We got Langley M. Neely, one of our super fans. 
uh, says, FYI, M15 is not the lower level to M16. M15 is the UK version of the FBI. They're cops, investigators working on British soil. M16 is their version of the CIA. They work outside the country. You don't go from five to six as a graduation, quote unquote. Well, just just before we get corrected again, I, I forgot to correct you at the beginning. It's it's M I six and oh. M I five. I so, can't read so, that. So, so yeah, so it's M I six and M I five, and basically Langley is dressing us down for thinking that like you graduate from M I five to M I six. Well, how, if, however, if you want to dress them down, at least you realize that I don't even know what M I means. I don't. I, was gonna, I think Bill has a competent rebuttal. Go ahead. Well, no, I was going to cop to that. That was me in the episode because I mm. was the one who was saying that he'd be recruited like out of MI5 and they he discovers that MI6 exists. I'll just cop to being an idiot. I, If I would have stopped to think about this, I probably would have realized I was wrong. But in the moment, I just assumed that MI6 was a made-up segment of the British government that just mm. existed above their version of the CIA – which in my mind was MI5. I think right, right, right. I do know that MI5 is basically the British FBI and MI6 is basically the British CIA. I think what I meant to say was the double O section is something yeah. that nobody knows about mm-hmm. that recruits out of MI6. But Langley, yeah. thank you for thank you for uh, policing our idiocy. <laughs> yeah, we appreciate that. Um, yeah. And I would like to re say MI. Thank you very much. There Austin. you go. Ron got it right the whole time. That's my story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Obviously, that's what I always do. Um, so we got alternate F8. That's the name of the commenter. Alternate I love fate. all of your it's names. Alternate, it's alternate fate, dude. It's alternate fate. No, no. I know that. I'm calling it F8 <laughs> because I like that better. <laughs> You know, like you push F8 to get something to happen on the computer. Come on. Alt F8. You don't know about that, Ed? I'm pushing it right now to get you to spit this question out. (laughs) (laughs) So full disclosure, I'm not a huge Bond fan, but based on your discussion, I think you may actually be talking about having two characters. What if the super spy isn't the 007? What if the actual super spy in Casino Royale was the dealer who made sure 007 won that hand by stacking the deck? So in this reboot, we'd be following the training of the super spy who makes sure the 007 gets things done. We watch this agent learn to manipulate the ego and actions of the 007 who believes himself to be a master of the craft, but we actually see them develop under the watchful eye of their hidden partner. Um, I don't know if that's good for a movie, but I find it totally entertaining. Well, I was going to say, that feels like not a James Bond movie, but somebody should write that movie as like a buddy comedy. (laughs) Yeah, that's well, uh, awesome. Also, uh, I think Melissa McCarthy, not to diss that idea because it, it obviously it could be good, but uh, I think Melissa McCarthy had a movie kind of like that. She was like the the girl in the yes. chair, and she would like listen to the to the stuff, and then she helped out the spy, but he like sucked. And it all might be jazz, Jason then, Statham's actual best movie, right? And then yeah, <laughs> she ends up beating him at spycraft at the end or something. But he turns out to not be so bad as long as he's whipped into to understanding who's boss in this spy game, which is this secretary turned way better than him at Spycraft. But she was, she just was denied opportunities or something, Paul Blart style or something. And yep. she finally got a chance to prove her mettle and she did it, you know? So. I like yeah. that movie a lot, actually. I don't it's, remember the I, name of it. But I it was enjoyed excellent. it. And it, it's not even like a plane movie to me. I think it's a like, okay, if I'm on, on dry land, I'm not captive. I might watch that movie. I think it's about that level. It's I, literally called Spy. Yeah, That's the name of the Spy. movie. Yeah. I gotta I gotta check that out because that always it it I like Melissa McCarthy and I like Jason Statham and that one it, it, I wanted to see it, but I very much thought it was a plane movie. So thanks, Ed. Mm-hmm. You, you helped me out. <laughs> I, I also want to add in Sean Hannon said Sean Connery is British because Scotland is in Britain. Yeah, there's <laughs> I, I, let me address this. Okay, so the United Kingdom, <laughs> the United Kingdom is England. Northern Ireland, Wales, and Scotland. Ireland is its own country. We know. We just don't know where all these guys are from. So thank you for letting us know. Pierce Brosnan is from Ireland, and uh, Sean Connery is from Scotland. So yes, he, I guess, is technically British. That's the thing. Does Britain refer to the whole UK? Because that was the one that I wasn't sure on. So I guess if it does, then yes, British could be from Scotland, Northern Ireland, England, Wales, whatever. But you tell yeah, me. Let us, I don't know. Let us know, you foreigners. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, and and, and uh, Chad Hunts was right about the weapon, the Kakari weapon, the uh, K- 
kind of boomerang looking blade that the Gurkha warriors used. Oh so yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. I think that's what, and, I think that's what it's called. And Charles said, it's also got Rose Byrne and Jude Law, the, the movie spy. And I, now I remember they were all great in it. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Okay, cool. Now I want to rewatch that movie. That was a fun movie. A lot so of I guess, yeah. So I guess that's, uh, that was basically all the comments. I just want to let you guys, you know, you know, say anything you want to say about how we rebooted that. How'd you feel about this whole thing? What do you think? Wait Anything a minute. You but, okay, the, the villain, <clears throat> just to recap, let's see if we can make this a little stronger. The villain was going to make, it was basically, uh, I think I must say, uh, wrapped it up exquisitely with, it's James Bond versus Halliburton, right? Sure. It ended up being basically like, these guys are the ones who are going to clean up after the mess, so you might as well make a mess <laughs> worth cleaning up after, you know, well, and, and how was, much money that would be. And it was John Peters who came in and said that the villain has to control the weather. And then yeah. we we got into talking about like <laughs> there is actually technology about seeding clouds, creating rainstorms. You take that, you yeah. know, one step further into science fiction and suddenly you're you're able to sort of produce hurricanes and things like that. And yeah, I, and I think I think you're right on. The idea is basically like there's huge money in being the person who's going to move equipment, who's going to rebuild buildings, who's maybe even owns the insurance or, or, you know, bets against the insurance, however the market works. But like, there's a lot of money to be made off of natural disasters. And if you're a company that is so tied in with the government that like, you have to snap to it when the, when something goes horribly wrong, then the government can't really afford to dismantle you. Mm -hmm. So FEMA. Well, FEMA's contractors, but no Halliburton. Yeah, I, I mean, Halliburton's a good example because yeah, they were more tied into oil, but they all they had their hands in a lot of things that the you know as just as government contractors. They, I mean, they yep. were they were military contractors, like the literally the CIA, the army. The, they would they would hire these guys to go and do missions um, on behalf of the U.S. and pay tens of millions of dollars. So. Yeah, there, there's something interesting there, and and as much as Bond has fought corrupt corporate villains before, I don't think he's ever really explored the military-industrial complex in that way. Dude, no, because he's always in support of it all the time. Mm. He's always helping it win. He's always, he's always, I, even my favorite one, uh, freaking, uh, uh, even my favorite one, uh, <laughs> freaking, what's it, what's it called? Um, it's in China. Uh, tomorrow, tomorrow never, never dies. dies yeah my, my favorite one in the beginning of that i do believe he's at like an arms market and everybody's like got these babushka hats on or whatever the hell and they're like all bound up with like wolf fur on and they're like digging through crates of grenades and rockets yeah yeah and he hops up in a plane and shoots them all and blows them up with the ill-gotten weapons and flies away <laughs> it's just you couldn't get more simple in we get to have super dope weapons you don't peace out you know, and he like stole a nuclear weapon from him or something. All this jazz, you know. So it's like it's very clear that the previous movies were about the military industrial complex. I think our contribution would be again, the Broccolis might not go for it. They might get leaned on by the actual military industrial complex. Yeah. That is the weird that is the weird X factor when you're talking about a bond reboot, because I I, yep. I feel like you know, even Warner Brothers, for as meddlesome and weird as they have been with their DC properties, they've at least shown a willingness as the studio to take some big creative swings. And so far, the what is it, Eon, the, whatever the company is that owns Bond, um, mm-hmm. they just have not. You know, Bond has just been this one thing with subtle variations. So the question is like, would they even allow a big swing to happen? I'm not sure. I mean, look, if we're going producer hat, I'm going to say no, because if you look at how successful all the bonds have been, uh, they've all been successful. Even like some of the weaker bonds still made solid money. I, I don't think, I don't think, I think when it comes to making money, doing something that if something is working, people don't change it. Mm hmm. For the most part, mm-hmm. like, would we love to see people have, take a chance and swing at some stuff like that? And people like us would, absolutely. Uh, but I think a lot of regular people probably wouldn't. I think a lot of regular people want to see that bond that you talked about. That's, uh, you know, the cynical, 
uh, tough guy who d- does what he wants to do and takes what he wants to take type of guy. So I don't know. I you know. think I think the first movie, if if we had to make it like that, I mean, I think I think that movie's easier to make. Honestly, you just go outsized personality villain, owner of Halliburton. Yep, like he's somewhere, and Bond is there, and Bond is there to investigate him and mess with him. They play Madden twenty twenty two on a big screen, and he lo- he uses the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to beat him in front of everybody because we got to make it youth oriented for the youth market, and we got to we got to we got a sponsorship with Xbox, so he beats the guy with an Xbox, you know. And the, I mean th- that movie can is going to be made in the next five years, something yeah, and- like that. And the weather, the thing that controls the weather is a giant laser beam on the moon, of course. Well, no, it, it, could be, it could be as cool as what we said. I mean, we're not that freaking smart. It could be just as cool as what we said. Yeah. Maybe a little tectonic plate thingy or something to go along with it. Like, we can make any disaster. We got a tectonic plate thingy. We got a cloud seed thingy. We got to turn a hurricane into a tornado back into it. We got a whole Pecos Bill situation over here. They, they could really pitch their, like, our ability is any disaster you need to hide money, to move stuff, to move people, to dispose of people, maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many people were lost in that earthquake. Oops. All of that, we're the evil corporation for all of your evil needs. And just just being that blase about it in the future, that'd be a nice concept, you know? I think, yeah. I mean, I think that's super interesting. Um, going, going to the chat, Chad Haunts, I was thinking Tom Felton for your bond. Chad, Tom Felton is a terrible actor. I, <laughs> I don't know. Tom Felton, what has he done? He's Draco Malfoy. Um, oh, that dude was in uh, with James Franco, the first new Planet of the Apes movie. He was terrible. Uh, he did a long <laughs> guest arc on The Flash on the CW. Also really bad. Like, Oh, yeah, I saw that. I saw that. He was like a, 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 a forensic scientist that was very upset at Barry for uh, being late all the time. He yeah. was like, you better not be late next time, I'll tell you. I mean, like, listen. He, he swept the chimney. Good, <laughs> good, good, cheesy uh, fun, and like, I, yeah. I'll, I'd say cast Tom Felton all day for extended guest arcs on CW shows, one hundred percent. But yeah. to carry the Bond franchise, are you smoking no. crack? Like, what? I'd rather, I'd rather have Radcliffe. <laughs> Seriously, one hundred percent. I'd yeah. rather have Ron freaking Weasley. What are you? What, yeah, what are we talking about here? Actually, yes, that's my new pick. Who played him? I can't remember his name, but that guy. <laughs> I can't remember his name either. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, guys, uh, I, thank you guys for checking out our rebooted rewind. Uh, we gave, we answered your questions. We, we went through the, the madness that was the bond. What do you guys, I just, before we leave, I just want to say, were you happy or you're not happy? Just say that. <laughs> Way in, in the chat. Come on. Are you guys still awake? Cause we are barely, we barely are. <laughs> I'm going to extend this until well, you guys Chad, fall asleep Chad, is Chad what I'm going to do. Uh, Chad goes, left my ass off, shot down. That's funny. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. That's what, I'm That's here what for. we do. That's what we do. That's what Reboot or Rewind is really all about, to listen to you guys and tell you how stupid you are. That's really... All no. we're doing here. No, that's just Ron, kidding, you, obviously. You never do that. That's what I do. No, you never that's do that's what you do. I don't do that. <laughs> I appreciate everything you guys do out there. You guys supporting us, leaving comments, giving us ideas to talk about on these rebooted rewinds or just in general. It's really appreciated. And uh on behalf of myself, I'm Ron Swallow. Uh Ed Gradu Ed Ed Gradier. His name is now Ed Gradier, you guys. On Ed Greer, producer Bill and Billy Business, who is cleaning poopy diapers right now. We want to thank you for watching and being a part of this really special community we built here. We love you guys. We'll see you all next time. Bye. Bye.